Welcome to another episode of Code for Thought. In this episode we'll be talking about mental health in the workplace. Ignoring it can lead to significant and at times tragic consequences, as we will hear from my guests Dave Hortswell and Graham McCartney in a short while. Dave and Graham lead a UK charity called Jonathan's Voice, and in this episode we talk about what steps organisations and we as individuals can take to keep us mentally healthy and help those who struggle. And here now my conversation with Dave and Graham. Hi Dave and Graham, welcome to the show. And today we're going to talk about a very important subject, mental health. But before we do, could you quickly introduce yourself? Maybe we can start with you, Graham. My name is uh, Graham McCartney, and I'm one of the uh, founders and a trustee of the mental health charity Jonathan's Voice. Jonathan's Voice aims specifically to focus on improving mental health and well-being in workplaces, uh, as well as raising awareness and funding research into suicide prevention. The charity has been in existence for something over three years, somewhere between three and four years. And the reason it's called Jonathan's Voice is that we set up the charity following the the tragic and unexpected uh, loss uh, by suicide of my son, uh, Jonathan. So Jonathan tragically took his own life in October 2017 at the age of 35. As a result of that, we decided that we would very much like to try and make some positive changes as a result of, of, of that and bring about some difference and make things better somewhere. It was for that reason that we set up the charity. And we felt that workplaces was an important place to start because there was so much stigma and taboo associated with talking about mental health in workplaces. And for us, that was an important role that our charity could play and focus on. Well, thanks very much uh, for sharing that. And I'm very sorry to hear that, Graham. And we're going to talk about some of the steps we can take in future a little bit later. Dave, over to you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, My name's Dave Horsfall, and I'm a research software engineer at Newcastle University. Uh, I've recently moved back into academia about 18 months ago, just at the start of the pandemic. Um, And something that's very important to me personally is to try and advocate for good mental health and well-being um, in the workplace. Graham and I have known each other for a long time, and John was the um, the connection between us. And I'd say that since coming back into this role as an ROC, I've really stepped up uh, my efforts to try and advocate in this space, just to start the discussion. So thanks very much for, for having um, us both on the show today. Well, my pleasure. I, as I said earlier, it's an important subject to talk about. And clearly, when sad things happen like what happened to you both and of course you Graham who lost your son then I think it's a high time that we actually do something about it and I think creating a charity is a very positive moment isn't it how did that actually help you to cope with that in those few months after John died it was it was obviously a tough few months and um, as his friends we were processing a lot of emotions that we hadn't done before, really, and we found that very challenging. And I think this, you know, establishing this charity, understanding that it was being established, was a, a really important to us. It gave us a focal point. It kept us close to Graham and Val, and um, just to some extent, and, and that was important for us as well, I think. Um, but then over the kind of preceding years, there's actually been a great deal of positivity that's come out of it. It's, it's kept us together. It's kept us in contact, and it's allowed us to fundraise for quite a lot of different initiatives, which have been very positive. And then more recently, obviously, the, the charity has supported some of my, my personal initiatives that I've tried to focus on within the research software engineering space. So it's kind of nice that that these things have come out of something so tragic. It's, it's been very helpful for us as well. I mean, it sounds like a very positive message in this tragic event, that it kind of channeled that into and focused the energy to something that might actually help and prevent future uh, mental health crises that can and go up to suicide. Uh, how big a problem do you think it actually has? How much of a problem do we have with mental health issues at work? I think it's difficult to quantify that problem, but what mm. I would point to is that around 2016, the government under the then Prime Minister, Theresa May, 
commissioned a, a review into mental health and well-being at work. And as a result of that review, a report was produced called the Stevenson Farmer Review, entitled mm-hmm. Thriving at Work. The great thing about that review they identified was that improving mental health of employees at work, it was more than just supporting individuals. They demonstrated that there was a clear business case for supporting mental health in the workplace. And I think that's, that was a real watershed in the UK, that we moved beyond just thinking, well, you know, we ought to be doing the right thing. We ought to be helping people. And the Stevenson Varma Review demonstrated very clearly that case studies showed a consistently positive return on investments made to improve mental health in the workplace. There was then a clear reason for all employers to identify mental health as a priority. The Stevenson Farmer Review helped with that and identified a number of core standards that workplaces could put in place to ensure that there was the best opportunity for all employees in that organisation mm-hmm. to thrive. And through thriving within an organisation, the organisation as a business would thrive. I think their review was a real watershed in pointing that out and developing a real case for employers to take action. I guess that one of the reasons why businesses do better when they care about mental health is because we tend to forget that mental health issues affect obviously the people who suffer from it directly and uh, with tragic consequences, as you mentioned earlier, but it also affects the people uh, around them as well. Obviously, there's a strong motivation to help the people who suffer, but also that it ultimately helps us as well. Uh, absolutely. I think you, you've, you've hit the nail on the head precisely, Peter, that there, there are many positive reasons for ensuring that, that mental health is addressed. And of course, it's important that we try to treat it, give it a parity to, to physical health and well-being, mm. that when we go to the office, people are happy to talk in the office about how many miles they've cycled, how many miles they've run, how many how many steps they've had, all those kind of things. So being positive about your physical health is readily accepted. And what we need to do now is try to move on and ensure that taking positive steps about your mental health is something that can be accepted and something that you feel happy to talk about and something that you feel willing to share with your colleagues. So it's it's moving beyond the view that, that mental health is somehow or other in, in a dark corner mm-hmm. and bringing it out in, into the light. And in fact, when I first started talking about this and trying to encourage organisations to to be more aware of mental health, I used to give my title Shining a Light on Mental Health because that's what I felt at that time, three years ago, was needed. We had to try to put it in the context of the overall well-being of individuals and we had to try and ensure people were happy to and open to talk about it in the same way as they would talk about their physical health. So all of those were important things in the early days. What is good, I think, is that we're now moving beyond that. We've got beyond just raising awareness and actually we're trying to help people do the best for their their employees and help everyone thrive in the organisation. I wouldn't go as far as saying finding solutions, but but that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to to, to encourage and, and support organisations to take those next steps. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, Dave? I think it's really important to talk about the fact that mental health isn't an interchangeable term with mental illness. And that's something that's, I think, commonly quite done at the start of this conversation. Um, when we talk about mental health, it's really, we're just talking about how we can all individually cope with the stresses of daily life. Mm. And so it ties in with this the, the findings of the Thriving at Work report, that there is actually a huge business case for really looking after people's mental health. But we're not just talking about people who suffer from depression and anxiety and have kind of diagnosed. We can all feel a lot better in our, in our workplace and in our lives by thinking of, about mental health and having that discussion. And that's why it's so important to initiate a kind of honest, genuine dialogue about these things uh, and make sure that just in our teams that we don't have any stigma about talking about how we're actually feeling just because you're not feeling very well that doesn't mean that you have a a problem that's going to require a lot of treatment you know we all feel down from time to time 
and we all feel anxious from time to time. Things that contribute to that are all of the stresses in our life, all of the risk factors, of which there are many. And we'll hopefully talk a little bit more today about specific risk factors for software mm-hmm. engineers and, and academia. Let's just talk about those things, try and identify what some of those are, recognize that we all feel them. Maybe that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to talk about mental health or mental illness. As you say, we ever now and then do feel down. Maybe that's also one of the reasons why it's so easy to dismiss. Oh, well, I'm having a bad day. Well, yeah, we all have that ever now and then. How do we actually recognize then that it's going beyond the standard up and down that we all go through in our lives? Let's talk about the the warning signs and the risk factors. The mental health problems at work are things like stress, anxiety, depression, But then, as Dave said, there there are the other less common mental health problems, which are more severe, which are personality disorders or eating disorders or addictions. And so there clearly has to be a distinction, as as David said, between those those different situations. I think what's, what's clear is that looking after your own mental health is essential and not a luxury, that individuals have to be aware of where they are on this this mental health spectrum and it's not it's not fixed it's something that changes with time your mental health can move along a spectrum but it's important that individuals recognize that and and take control and and learn about their own mental health because it's important that they recognize signs in themselves and be aware of the the impact that it's having on their work or on their relationships or on other situations in which they find themselves When we try to have these conversations about mental health in the workplace, this is not about trying to diagnose yourself or trying to diagnose others, however well-intentioned that is. At that point, it's about pointing people to professional services. So that those can, I mean, in a university, those um, can be employee assistant programs, mental health advisors of the university, counselling services. Universities do tend to actually provide quite a lot of services that are underutilized because people don't want to reach out and get help. So they do exist and it's important to use them. But again, because of the stigma and because of pe- people's anxiety about actually getting help, it, it doesn't have to be through the university or a supervisor or a manager. You can go external to the university and um, get help that way. So it could be a GP. It can be uh, charities of which there are many Samaritans, Mind, uh, and they'll all provide support to people who are potentially facing crisis or need extra support. You mentioned a report, a government report that came out uh, in previous years. What kind of concrete steps can companies and organisations do to ensure that there is support uh, to keep ourselves mentally healthy? Perhaps, Peter, I can sort of take it from a general Mm -hmm. point of view. I think the message we would have is that it's crucial that recognition of mental health and well-being in the workplace starts at the top. So it has to be something where leaders of the organisation really buy into this as being something they want to be serious about. So a senior individual, a senior leader in an organisation has to drive through the agenda of mentally healthy workplaces. Mm -hmm. And we would suggest that we put forward what we call a three-tier model for a mentally healthy workplace. First of all, a preventative level, and that's about leaders creating a culture that supports good mental health and well-being for everyone. Mm -hmm. The second is a, a proactive level, and this really includes putting in place things like risk assessments and initiatives aimed at preventing mental health difficulties occurring or even anticipating when they might arise. And then the third level, which you hope is not reached very often, is the reactive level, where you have mechanisms in place to support individuals who may be struggling with with their mental health. The most basic level that organisations should start with is is the preventative tier, which is all about creating a culture which supports good mental health and well-being for for everyone. And so that should be about, for example, challenging the, the issue of stigma about mental health by encouraging there to be workshops or learning lunch events or talks or speakers talking about mental health and the leaders themselves being prepared, if appropriate, to share their um, their situations. 
And so it's very important that, that company leaders set the culture and that they are compassionate in the way they lead. So that's a, a very crucial level which all organizations should be starting with. So, for example, tackling any unhelpful cultural practices, and we might come back to this when we talk about academia, mm -hmm. of working long hours and maybe being on realistic deadlines, things like uh, not taking annual leave, always being available to work 24-7. So, so issues like that are, are cultural, organizational cultural issues, which leaders need to be able to address. Yeah, well, there's a nice segue into the question that I have for Dave, because uh, you work in the academic sector at Newcastle University. You already mentioned some steps that universities are taking. So what, what do you see are the challenges in order to provide mental health in the academic sector, and in particular in research software engineering, which is where you are? Mental health in academia is something that's been increasingly discussed over recent years. I'd say that the sector is finally waking up to some of the complexities mm. of the challenges that exist. From an organizational perspective, I think I'm not sure that there's a lot that I can add that Graham hasn't already talked about. So one thing that's important to me in terms of what I'm trying to achieve is a much more granular level. So when we look at teams, the work that I do really has very simple aims of firstly trying to reduce stigma and creating environments where people feel they can talk about mental health freely within at the actual specific team level, because I think that makes a big difference and is the first step, but also raising awareness. So just trying to have the conversation to, to actually give people the ability to have the, to explain how they're feeling, have the conversation, mm -hmm. uh, and then potentially try to drive meaningful change from within their own organizations. And that's really important. And that's how these things can work. It can be an effective catalyst for change. Peter, can I jump in there as well? I, I had a post in academia as well, so may, maybe I'll, <laughs> I'm allowed to put in a few observations of, of my mm -hmm. own. In universities, there's obviously been, a, and rightly so, a huge emphasis on, on looking after undergraduate students. And I think there have been huge strides in promoting mental health and well-being. I think an area which has received less attention has been the well-being of postgraduate research students, early career researchers, possibly on, on many on temporary contracts, and of course, ultimately, the, the academic staff themselves. And I think, sadly, that's taken a backseat to um, the development of support systems and structures for, for undergraduate students. Mm. And I think now is the time that uh, universities need to refocus and redouble their efforts to look after all their academic staff, bearing in mind the intense pressures there are on academic staff, research staff, and postgraduate researchers to deliver results, to compete in a very competitive environment. The competition for funding is mm -hmm. intense, uh, and it's global, not just in the UK. And to ensure that the enthusiasm that, that the vast majority of academics have and the passion that they have for their work doesn't spill over into an unhelpful cultural situation where individuals who are working long hours and enthusiastically working in long hours recognize that that is not something that everyone in the organization can sustain. But stigma means a cultural change and cultural change is difficult. Ultimately, what we're aiming for is to actually change people's attitude and behavior. You already mentioned a number of steps in terms of promoting better practices, having talks and presentations, etc. Are there any other ideas of how you think you can combat the stigma around surrounding mental health and talking about mental health? I think what's been useful has been the training by many organizations of mental health first aiders, and because it means that at a local level on the ground, there are people who are recognized in many organizations now as having undergone a training to be mental health first aiders. And, and, and they are people who, who are there to support and help at, at the first stage of, of issues arising. They're clearly not trained to be psychologists or psychiatrists, but they're there to support and help and recognize, point individuals to where they might need professional help and support. So I think having mental health first aiders is a, a very effective way 
of taking first steps in breaking down stigma and saying, yeah, I recognize, I recognize there's something about mental health. It kind of sets it on the similar sort of level to physical well-being where you have a first aider and you know the first aider can patch up, you know, your finger when you've caught it in the filing cabinet <laughs> drawer. But, you know, they're not going to be seriously diagnosing problems that you have. And, and, and that's the role that a mental health first aider can play as well. So that visibility is a good first step, I think. I'd certainly echo that with mental health first aid. It's a course that I have um, completed. I think it aids, again, having the conversation within teams, like who wants to do the mental health first aid course? Mm. Why is it important? It starts the conversation from the, the course that I completed. It gives a kind of good understanding of what that what the responsibilities of that role is. They should be looking for basic first symptoms and warning signs to look out for. You're also a fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute, and I think you got the bid uh, on the premise of working in the area of mental health. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? What do you aim to do with the fellowship in terms of mental health? Absolutely. I was really thrilled to be awarded an SSI fellowship this year. The proposal was really general advocacy of mental health, specifically within research software engineering, mm. um, but it did have three aims. We, we talked about some of the statistics and I have specific statistics for academia and also software engineering, but we really don't have any stats for software uh, research software engineering. So we don't know what the landscape looks like for mental health within research software engineering. So the first milestone of my fellowship is the kind of creation and publication of hopefully a large national mental health survey that will capture most of the research software engineering profession in the mm -hmm. UK and potentially beyond as well. Having the results from that will give us a really strong evidence-based roadmap for what's going to come in the future. So when we talk about what can academia do, what can research software engineering do to kind of solve some of these problems, I think the first step is it's necessary for us to actually understand what the problems are. So that's the first step of my fellowship plans. And then following on from that, I'd like to create a small workshop specifically for RSE teams where we can talk about mental health. It would in some ways potentially be similar to the mental health first aid course, where the, the objective is primarily to reduce the stigma and get teams talking about it, but also to just raise awareness about what some of the co common problems are. Just a quick follow-up question from there. I mean, it sounds like a good idea to do the survey. What I would like to know, do you think there is a difference in the way we need to talk about mental health in a research software environment rather than academic? Or is it just a question that we simply don't know if there's a problem at all? We can't assume that there's a problem, although we have survey results from very similar professions that indicate that there is a huge prevalence of mental health conditions in the workforce. Just as an example of that, Nature's 2019 PhD survey found that over a third of respondents had specifically sought help for depression and anxiety re relating directly to their studies. So, so that's the kind of academic side. And then if we look at software engineering, the Stack Overflow 2020 survey found that 7.2% of the participants suffered from anxiety and 7.2% suffered from uh, depression. You know, we're kind of somewhere in the middle of that uh, in terms of profession. So let's do the survey and um, try and find out exactly what's happening. And again, I go back to that point that I made earlier that it's not just about supporting people with diagnosed mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. It's about everyone in a team recognizing that they can kind of change habits and develop new strategies for coping with the daily stresses that do cause them stress. We, we all deal with stress differently, but we can have the discussion together and we can support one another and we can kind of learn how to listen without judgment and be kind and compassionate. This isn't just about um, making sure that you are well, it's about looking after each other and making sure that everyone else on your team is well. Not only is that a nice thing to do that we should be doing, but also it means that, that teams are much more productive And this really highly skilled workforce that we have in the UK, research software engineers, is maintained and that people can kind of be persistent in those careers and go on and develop how they want to develop later in life. These are proactive steps. But Graham, you mentioned earlier 
reactive steps. And I think it was part of the study or the report, the government report that you mentioned. It's a stage that you said we shouldn't really reach because we should be proactive enough to prevent that from happening. But could you talk a little bit about these reactive steps that uh, organizations or indeed individuals could take? When you get to the reactive stage, that's when you're trying to identify and look after the individuals who are who are struggling. Mm -hmm. And it is important for organizations to be able to recognize the signs that someone is struggling and important to routinely ask people how they are, whether it's on a day-to-day -day basis or in when they have their one-to-one -one meetings and appraisals. At that point, recognizing when people are struggling may mean knowing about how to refer on and how to direct people to, to help and support. So, for example, there are many self-help uh, materials widely available. So if you recognize that, that somebody in your team is struggling and you're a team leader, then you may need to encourage them to, to engage in some kind of self-help. If things have gone beyond that, then you might need to, to recommend that, that a staff member talk to a mental health first aider. If you have a mental health first aider in the team or in the group, most universities have some kind of employee assistance program of, of some kind or occupational health facility. So I think team leaders in particular, people who manage, need to be really aware of the help and support that can be provided mm -hmm. because if someone does get to that tier three where they, they need reactive support, then team leaders or managers or supervisors need to know where and how to help those individuals. And of course, if you feel there's, there is a serious risk of suicide, and I guess there are the Samaritans, mm. there are organizations such as CALM who can help individuals who are in crisis. And we would very much hope that people don't get to crisis, but they may do. And I guess at this point, I, I would say that people listening to this, there may be some people listening who who have felt or, or do feel that are a crisis point, and I would urge them to please do go and talk to an organization like the Samaritans, seek help, talk to someone, do not struggle on your own. There's one question that pops up. You mentioned that team leads and managers need to be proactive. But sometimes too much of a good thing can also be a bad thing. If you put yourself into the shoes of a team lead who's then going about asking everybody, how are you, how are you, to the point where it might get perhaps a little bit too intrusive. I don't know how to express this, but like you're a little bit overbearing in the will to do good. Could you give any advice where to draw the line and how to actually respond that isn't overbearing to the people that you're looking after? It's such a good observation because I've come into this advocacy space and kind of all guns blazing to some extent sometimes. And I feel that I, I talk about it too much. And there's definitely times where I've been given signs from team members that I work with. It's exactly that. It's not that they're having a problem and they just don't want to talk about it. They just don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to talk it's about important it to recognize. Yeah. Exactly. It's important to recognize that, you know, it is hard to strike a balance. And I'd say that it's about creating an environment where people feel they can at least go to someone appropriate and talk about problems mm. that they're having. So creating that space where it's supportive, but not intrusive. You don't initiate these conversations in a team meeting and insist that everyone tells everyone else how they're feeling or what problems they might be having. That's mm. not the way to go about this. But It might start with managers sharing their own experiences, but without any expectation from anyone else to do the same. And another thing that I've personally found very useful uh, in starting the conversation is that I've started to increasingly do more talks about this subject. And I use interactive presentation software called Mentimeter. So I'd like to thank the RSC Society for giving me access to that, which has been great. But it allows people who are present at the talk or participating in the talk to go to a website and answer questions anonymously so that mm -hmm. you can you can ask questions about how people are feeling and they can respond immediately. It kind of empowers other people in the presentation to see that well, actually other people are kind of being honest. That has been really, really great. Thanks very much. Uh, we're coming to the end of the podcast recording now. There's one thing that I'd like to ask, uh, finally. You mentioned mental health first aider. And I've seen that at uh, UCL where I work. How do you become one? I mean, where would you go? So to become 
a mental health first aiders. There's lots of places across the UK that run the course. I personally did mine through St. John's Ambulance. There's a centralized website, Mental Health First Aid England, Mm -hmm. uh, where you can search by date and location and it'll give you courses. So Mental Health First Aid England, uh, franchise providers. So essentially you have to be approved as a provider for Mental Health First Aid training by Mental Health First Aid England. And then you can set up and run courses from your own organization. There are different levels of courses. There's a full mental health first aid training course, which I think lasts two days. There are then shorter courses, which uh, don't lead to a full mental health first aid trainer qualification. So the way to look for these is to visit Mental Health First Aid England website, look for accredited accredited trainers and providers. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a fee uh, which is a few hundred pounds for a full course, which includes training manuals and materials. They're widely available across acro- across England under that arrangement. One final question would be then regarding risk factors in research software engineering in particular. I, mean, I know that we touched about this a little bit earlier. I think this is really relevant for the audience who's going to be listening. Uh, we mm. talked earlier about academia there's a very unique set of stresses within academia that exist. There's obviously a, a huge overlap with it, specifically within research software engineering. But I'd like to just kind of discuss a, a few of those. Some of the risk factors are isolation, and this is a, this has a massive crossover with uh, academia generally and PhD students. Most of the time, we work in isolation. And that might be because we are working on very specialized subjects, which not a lot of people understand. It might be because we're working away from home. It can be a real problem for for people working in this industry. And loneliness is a huge stress factor for people's mental health. This is where we kind of go back to the importance of support networks and team members. Actually, to be a good software engineer, you really need a lot of good social skills and you need to be social. So you need to kind of be able to discuss system Mm -hmm. designs with uh, your colleagues and team members. You need to be able to actually mentor junior developers, and also kind of report to your manager. Something that we haven't really talked about today is the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, This has kind of exacerbated the loneliness factor because a lot of developers made the switch to working from home very rapidly. Mm. The the thing about our industry is that actually when the pandemic hit, it was almost like a switch. Nothing changed in terms of workload and what we were doing, but we all just went home. And so we never, Mm. we didn't see each other. And actually, I think there's a huge impact on mental health around that. Other risk factors are kind of being sedentary, sitting on your bottom too much, like Hmm. even standing desks kind of don't mean that you're being active. You're just standing up and they can help. That lack of physical activity is something that can have a direct impact on your on your mental health. I find talking about a lot of these things and then suggesting solutions or or kind of strategies of dealing with them quite hard because I'm really bad at following that advice. Like I'll just sit at my <laughs> desk. Like you, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but even just taking five minutes every hour or it doesn't even have to be that frequently can can really change your mood. And as developers, I think we can often just not think about that. Uh, when when we're developing, particularly when we are actually developing and you're debugging and you're just scrolling through lines of um, documentation, you, you know, you get very focused and you can lose track of how it is you're actually feeling in that very specific moment. And we should take a little bit of time to be mindful and just take some breaks. And that can help. That personally helps me a lot as well. The thing about research software engineering is that actually it's a very new role. It's still being defined. It's very much in flux, but lots of engineers will work kind of end to end on a specific project. So they'll take ownership of the whole thing. Where so, so in bigger teams, like in industry or in other sectors, you might be a smaller part of the cog or you're not responsible for the whole thing. But that's something that I found since coming back into this or coming to this role and, and talking with team members is that you, you take the project from the start right to the very end. And because of that, you've got a lot of context shifting. You're having to make huge amounts of decisions all the time to try and keep things on track. And that can be very hard. I think we have now come to the end of this podcast. I'd like to talk a little bit more about COVID-19 and the effect it has on not only our health, but also our mental health because of the isolation. But I think we've run out of time. But yes, it is an important factor. I would like to thank you both very much for your time today and for this very good interview. 
uh, in the metadata of this podcast, there will be some links and some signposting that people can go to in case uh, they would like to find out more. Before we go into the holiday season at the end of 2021, here are a few notes. I'll be taking a short break until the new year, and in January, I'll be starting the new and third season of Code for Thought with lots of topics that I hope you'll find interesting. For instance, we'll find out how mantises can see in three dimensions, what it is about agile software development, and you'll be meeting the newly appointed fellows of the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK, and plenty more. I hope to see you all again then. Until then, I hope you all have a chance to take a break, stay safe and well, and with that, goodbye.